going to go to this church on Wednesday night, too. It's, uh, it's probably just like the rest of them, but i got to check it out. They're having a Bible study. It's like a backwoods church around where I was working. Uh, going towards Batavia. I forgot what the name of it. It wasn't even really a town, it was like a block in the middle of the woods. Where was Ruth again? I can't ever find it. Right after Judges. Oh, that's right. Okay, root chapter 1. And again, this is about this is a story about Christ and the church, prophecy. In chapter 1 of Ruth says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. So there was a famine in the land. This is a story about salvation. Right? And what brings you to Christ? You all of a sudden wake up one day and realize that you want to you be a child of God? Or does your life just fall to pieces? Is there a severe famine that happens? Well, with me it was a severe famine. So there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, and the name of the man was Elimelech. So Elimelech means, in the, uh, Hebrew, it means God of the king. That's what Elimelech means. God of Christ. Who's the, who's the king? Jesus Christ. So this was a picture. This God of the king, God of Christ, came out of Bethlehem, Judah. Right? So this was a picture of God that was bringing his family into Moab. And isn't that what the Lord did with uh, Israel? With Abraham's children, he brought them into Egypt, led them into captivity among the heathen. Is that what he does with us? You know, he knocks us off our high horse and brings us into captivity. Makes us, brings us into uh, severe famine and, just, and destroys our life so we can rebuild it with him. And so Elimelech, the god of the king... And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. So Naomi in this story represents the law of God, and Naomi means agreeable and pleasant. Because when the Lord first meets you on your first conversion, the law is rather pleasant seeming and agreeable. Well, yeah, Lord, I can do that. I can fulfill the Ten Commandments. Hey, get down, I don't know where it is. Uh, Emily, can you get him downstairs for me? And tell Carolyn to keep the kids down there. We'll find it. Come on. So, Naomi represents the law. And in the beginning stages of our, our Christianity, the law is really quite pleasant. Oh yeah, Lord, I'll, I'll fulfill the law. I'll, I'll do all that, right? And isn't that where most of the Christians are in the state of today? So-called Christians, all these churches, they got them believing that they're actually fulfilling the law through the flesh. And they're all acting nice, you know, and oh, how are you today, brother? It's like, oh, how are you? But inside, they're, you know, they're laying in wait and 
and they're deceived and they're being deceived by these pastors. You know, the pastors are all acting all holy and then going home and watching porn and, you know, isn't that how the whole Christian world is? And isn't that why we got such a bad name? Thanks. So isn't that why we have such a bad name today? Is because we have all these hypocrites going around pretending like they're fulfilling the law and everybody knows better. Because the law is agreeable to them. Right? Whereas in a true child, a true child of God, uh, the law is not something that can be fulfilled in the flesh. We understand that. And when the law comes upon us, it's not agreeable or pleasant or whatsoever. It's very grievous. It's like sucks the life right out of you. Oh, Lord, forgive me. So we'll get into that. So Elimelech, God of the king, has a wife, and his wife is the law. And the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilon, were Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. So, we have God of the king who's wed to the law, and the law produces two sons, Milon and Chilon. And Milon in the, in the Hebrew means to be weak, sick, and afflicted, and Chilon is to cease, finish, or destruction. That's what, a, that's what the law produces in a true child of God, right? The law doesn't produce all these you know, wonderful things like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's like when the law comes upon a believer brought by the king, it brings destruction, uh, weakness, sickness, and affliction. That's what the law brings. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to Elimelech, God of the king. He brought every person in his house to a state of vanity in the land of unfruitfulness. Why did God do that? Well, in, in Romans 8.20, I'm going to go just go through, burn through a bunch of verses. You can turn to these, find these later if you want. Romans 8.20, Paul says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. So God made us subject to vanity. What does subject mean? Subject means that you're in bondage to, that you're serving, you, you're enslaved to vanity. God did that to us. The creature was made subject to vanity. Not willingly, totally, we're born into this world subject to vanity. It's against, you know, it's not as though that we just desire wickedness just because that we have a free will to do it. You're bound to desire wickedness. You have no choice in the matter. You're made subject to vanity, not willingly. Right? And that's what, where, why we blast this free will gospel all the time. Oh, you have a choice. You don't have a choice. You're made subject to vanity. Not willingly but by reason of Him who has subjected the same in hope. By God you were made subject to vanity, who also subjected, subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So that's what this story is all about. That's why Elimelech led his family into Moab, into that barren country, into those that, that heathen done. God did that, just like He did with us. He led us into captivity. That's why the rest of the world, these free willers, they can't see their captivity. They think, oh, they have a choice and they can do this. Yeah, they don't see, unlike the children of God, realize that they're bound to sin and death. They're bound to uh, the destruction of the flesh. I mean, why do we smoke cigarettes and, and eat, eat McDonald's? We know it's not good for us because we're bound to the flesh. But we realize that. We can't overcome that flesh or these thoughts or anything else unless the Word does it for us, right? Because Jesus, Jesus Christ is the Word and unless you're married to Him, you're not going to overcome anything without Him. Nothing. You're not even your own train of thought you're held captive to. See, we have a great understanding. The Lord gave us this understanding. He, he, he made us to realize, you know, how we're led into captivity so that 
um, for the reason that that we would see that we shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Right? You can't be delivered in, into the glorious liberty of the children of God until you understand your enslavement. Can you? So, Elimelech, God, for the purpose of drawing... He, he brought us into a state of vanity for the purpose of drawing and directing His children to Him. First by the law, after through Christ. And isn't that why Jesus Christ says, No man can come to Me except God the Father that sent Me draw him. No man can come to Jesus Christ in and of his own will, desire. He says, God needs to draw you first before you can come to me. That's what God says about the matter. So, how God draws us is He leads us into captivity. And that's in Luke 10.22 is, is the nail in the coffin here. Luke 10.22, Jesus Christ says, explaining everything we just went over, all things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father. And who the Father is but the Son. And he to whom the Son will reveal him. Meaning, you can't know God unless Jesus Christ reveals God to you. And you can't know Christ unless God draws you to him. So that's what Elimelech does. He draws his children, God draws his children into a land of captivity for the purpose that they would acquire an understanding about who they are so that they could be wed to Jesus Christ. No man can ascend to God unless he first descends into himself. That's what Kelvin says. We need to understand ourselves before you can understand God. I mean, isn't that what the Lord says throughout the Old Testament? My people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of, they perish for a lack of knowledge about Him. Well, why don't they know Him? Because they don't understand themselves. they got all these hypocrites and these blasphemers on the radio telling us all about God. And they don't know nothing. They don't even know the very basics about themselves. The morons can be able to tell you who God is. when they, they, they refuse to believe how sinful and wicked and depraved they themselves are. Nothing but a bunch of imbeciles. I don't know nothing. So, so we have Naomi, which represents the law of God. And after being drawn by God, when the Lord presented the law to us, it was pleasing and we were excited to fulfill it for Him, right? That's what happened to me. I was excited to fulfill the law. Okay, Lord, I'll do it, you know. And, <clears throat> where I didn't know in Matthew, I didn't know that, or pay attention to what Christ says in Matthew 5.27, You have heard that it was said of them by old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You broke the law right there. Oh, so you don't screw around on your wife, or you don't, uh, you know, you don't lie and you don't steal. Well, you just... I, I mean, I don't know how you can go down the street nowadays with all these half-naked women and just pretend like we're so pious and holy that we don't take notice of that nonsense. Of course we do. You know? It's bound to happen. So we're lawbreakers. You can't, you can't fulfill the law. But all these righteous people can fulfill it, can't they? These holy, holy people. Well, what is the law for anyway? Well, in Romans 8, chapter 1, Paul explains, There is now, therefore, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. 
For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So the law is weak in the flesh, meaning nobody can fulfill it in the flesh. You need Jesus Christ to fulfill it through you. And that's what's going on, but Jesus Christ isn't going to fulfill it through you until you're first wed with Christ, wed to Christ. And that's what's going to happen later on in this book. We're going to get to that. But you don't, first, you don't just come to God and just get married to Christ right away. You have to first be committed to the law. The law is applied to your heart, right? And so that's what's going on right now. The believer is led out into the country of Moab in a fruit, fruitless desert, and the law is applied to him. Why? Why is the law applied? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Why is the law applied? Well, Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. So the law is applied to us to reveal to us our sinfulness. This is God's way of dealing with us, showing us our sinfulness, showing us our need of Him. Right? So when you have... An unbelieving free willer out there who goes to church every Sunday and tells everybody that Jesus loves them. They're not using the law lawfully, not realizing that they can't fulfill the law. Because the law, instead of commending themselves to themselves, should be putting them in the dirt, making them see that they cannot do anything worthy of God's love. What shall we say is the law sin? God forbid. I had not known sin but by the law. The law is there to make us, to reveal to us our sinfulness. Right? It's to reveal, that's what it says. I had not known sin but by the law. I had not known lust except the law said thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So there, there was no sin without the law. Before, before the Lord laid the law upon our hearts, we weren't sinners. We, we, didn't, we didn't realize our sinfulness. Without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, see, says the commandment. When the commandment came, so what is the law? You know what the law is? It's the Holy Spirit. It comes upon you. Oh, convicts you of all that wickedness and wretchedness. So why did all these other so-called believers believe that they can fulfill the law? It's because they don't have the Spirit within them, convicting them. If they had the Spirit of Christ within their heart, that spirit, the commandment that came unto him would convict them and say, you're guilty, you broke it. And it put them right in the dirt where they belong. Right where God put us in the dirt. So why are they going about believing they can fulfill the law? Well, they don't have the Lord revealing to them that it's impossible. And the only way the Lord's going to reveal that to them is if they hear the Word of God. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? Faith, the presence of Jesus Christ, can't come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So that's what we're here to, down to do, is to say, you can't fulfill the law. Why are you even trying? Why are you pretending that you're fulfilling the law and then going and doing this over here? You know, they need to hear the Word of God. So, when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. In the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Because when Jesus Christ comes into you, you know, the purpose of Jesus Christ is to bring life to His children. Well, you can't have life unless you die first. Paul says, I, I die daily. You know, we need to die, die to the flesh and, the, and to sin daily. 
it's really an easy thing to do when you're living in the spirit, but when you're a child of God living in the flesh, that seems like such an outrageous concept. I just can't, I can't, I can't handle that right now, Lord. Maybe next year, when I get every all my ducks in a row, you know. The flesh don't wanna, don't think you can go through it. Well, you're not thinking right. The flesh has nothing to do with it. So I found the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good meaning Jesus Christ comes into you. Your, your sin becomes exceeding sinful. Right? Because when you have light that comes into darkness, it illuminates and reveals everything that was in that darkened room. Now you can see everything in that room, whereas before it was just pitch black. You have a, you know, you got a room in the back of your house that doesn't have any windows, you just fill it full of garbage. You're not concerned about it, you just you can't see what's in there. But then you bring a light into that room and you're like, oh my gosh, look at this. Look at this mess i got to clean up. Right? So, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Jesus Christ comes into our heart to reveal our sin, our exceeding sinfulness unto us. So that's the only way you're going to work it out, right? You're going to get motivated. It's when it's like, poof. Your sin is so, is so disgusting, it's so far over your head. First of all, you realize you can't do it yourself. Which is a revelation above that of many of uh, the other churchgoers around here. Because they can do it, right? Okay, Lord, we'll start cleaning it up and doing this and that, you know. The Lord doesn't want you to do it. He wants to do it. He'll do it right. He'll just screw it up. So that's what the law is about. And that's why Naomi, the law, produced Mylon and Chilon. She produced two children who were both examples of Mylon to be weak, sick, and afflicted with your sin, and Chilon to cease, finish, and destruction, cease from your works, you know, and your own self-destructive lifestyle. That's what that represents. So, back to uh, Ruth. We'll go through two one more time. And the name of the man was Elimelech, God of the king, and the name of his wife Naomi. And the name of his two sons, Mylon and Shilon, Ephrathites, of Bethlehem, Judah. Ephrathites, I looked that up. It was something to do with the promise of God. Something to do with God's promise. Right? And, uh, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimech, Naomi's husband, verse 3, died, and she was left and her two sons. Well, God just died here, didn't He? Well, God can't die. Well, you know what happened when God gave His Son, sent His Son into Israel? God the Father just withdrew. And everybody was left. There was no open vision in those days. Everybody was left with Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And the only way you could get to God was through Christ now. So when it says that God died, what it really is going, it's a picture of God uh, uh, receding into the background and leaving you with Jesus Christ. Because that's the only way you can now get to God. You can't just go to God directly. You need an atonement. You need Jesus Christ, a mediator, right? So God dies and leaves the world with Christ in the, in the law. So 
So, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. Now, we got to spend a little time. This is really pretty interesting. So, Naomi's two sons took them wives. Wives from the children of Moab. Now, do you know what Moab, Moab means? Well, Moab was a son of Lot. Okay? So Moab represents, what it means in the Hebrew is from the seed of her father. So Moab's daughter took it upon herself to preserve seed of her father. She wasn't commanded to do that. That was actually, that was not right. That was incest. She had to get him drunk in order for that to happen. That right there will tell you it wasn't right. They knew it was. The father wouldn't have done that otherwise. That's why they got him drunk. So Moab represents the works of the flesh in order to obtain everlasting life. Isn't that what we have down here? Isn't that the prevailing gospel of the day? The free will gospel? You take the seed of the Father upon yourself? Jesus, Jesus Christ loves everybody and all you do have to do is make a decision. You have the power in and of yourself to produce seed unto God the Father. Isn't that the Gospel? You don't need, you don't need Jesus Christ, Christ's seed within you uh, to produce faith. You have, you have, everybody is born with a, their own seed. right? You just need to make a decision. So that's what we're telling people today. Everybody born into the world has a, has a seed that's worthy of God's love. Everybody believes that gospel when they're born into this world. Everybody believes that the flesh can save them. Everybody. That's why they took to themselves. There's two of them. There's two women that each of these sons took. And they're from Moab, which means from the seed of their father, and that's the gospel, prevailing gospel today. And the one woman, Orpah, these are two disciples. And God will always use two examples in the gospel. He says, we have the wheat and we have the tares. And he says, let's let them grow up together, right? And the wheat and the tares, what's interesting is, you know, they're hard to, dis to distinguish between the two a lot of times. They grow up right next to each other, you know. So Orpah, Orpah, and the Hebrew means stiff-necked. And Ruth means friend or affection. Okay? So, after the death of her husband, Naomi's husband, the law, acquires two daughters, two disciples, through the bonds of her offspring. So now, Naomi, the law, her offspring... The law brings about death, affliction, acquires two daughters, two disciples. The wheat and the tares. The wheat experiences the annulment of their sin washed away by the blood of the Lamb, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. While the tares are to deceived into thinking their false gospel and lukewarm worship cleanse them. You know, Every terror that I deal with, every so-called child of God and Christian, they believe that their sins were purged. They believe that they actually know who God is and they pray and they go to church. They don't understand that they were not forgiven at the cross. Or, or they're not cleansed as of yet, otherwise they'd have proper understanding of themselves and God. Not to say that they're not God's children. They might be, but they're being deceived. So... <clears throat> Let's continue to read now. The name of the one was Orpah and Four, and the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelled there about ten years. And Mylon and Chilon died, also both of them, and the women, woman was left of her two sons and of her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, 
For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So the law arises. The law just lost both of her sons. She acquired these disciples. And now the law says, well, it's time to see which one of these disciples is going to really cling to me, right? She's going to bring him into the kingdom of heaven. The law. That's the whole purpose of the law is to bring us into the kingdom of heaven, right? And what brings, what brings a child of God into the kingdom of heaven? The bread of life. Which is where? In Jerusalem right now. So, in the seven, Wherefore, Naomi went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So Jesus Christ, when he was down here on earth, he had quite the following, didn't he? There were two types. There were the wheat and the tares that were following Christ around. I mean, Peter and, and John and all of them were the true children of God. So that when Jesus turned and said, you know, will you also leave me? Because a lot of his other disciples left them. They walked with them for a while. Peter said, Where, whither will we go, Lord? For thou hast the words of eternal life. Right? So these two disciples, which represent the wheat and the tare, yeah, they went with Naomi for a little while. They're on their way back to the land of Judea. In number eight, and Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kind with you, we kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they both lifted up their voice and wept. So the law, the law on our way back, on our way to the kingdom of Judea, well, I'll tell you, you know what? You can't do it. You better just turn back from where you came from. You don't have the power to you don't have the power to fulfill this journey. You know why the law tells us that? Because the child of God will cleave and say, I can't do it, Lord, you can do it. You can do it, and I'm not leaving you. Whereas the, the heathen will say, Well, you know, you're right. And they'll turn and go their way. So, and the Lord grant you, number nine, and the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. So they had houses there. They had houses in the land of Moab. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have, I have hope, and if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Judas kissed her mother-in-law. Betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? You never intended to stay with me from the get-go, Judas. But Ruth clave under her. That's what the child of God will do. Clave under her king. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back under her people. And unto her gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return with, 
from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if I ought, ought but death depart me and thee. Amen. Free will right there. Yep. So where can you find that? You guys want to turn to John chapter 6, verse 53. This is this gets really good. You can find this right here in John chapter 6, verse 53. We got two disciples. One kissed Jesus and went back to where he first dwelt, and the other clave to him. John chapter 6, verse 53. Jesus Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat my flesh, eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my, drink, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And as a living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me even shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. Stop. These two disciples are on their way with the law back to Judea for what? Bread. Bread. Bread of life, right? That's the whole purpose, Naomi going back to Judea for bread. Well, Jesus Christ, Naomi stops on the way back, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. One of them disciples realized that that was impossible. I can't do that. So these things said he unto the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? Meaning, does this turn you away? Offend means to turn away. What if she shall see the Son of Man ascend up from where he was before? If my sayings offend you, then my resurrection is really going to offend you. No matter what you think you believe. It is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, who should betray him. That's why Naomi stopped and said, you go your way into your own house. Because Naomi knew, or Jesus Christ knows, that in telling all these people, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? that some of them were turned back. Well, don't you think that if Jesus wanted to save them all, He would have said something a little more cordial or a little more uh, appetizing than, well, you need to eat my flesh. Here's an arm, Peter. Here's a leg. And drink my blood. That's how they took it. Yeah. Don't you think if Jesus wanted to save them all, He would have been a little more clear? Like Naomi? You need to just go back to your own gods and your own house. Orpah said, okay, you know, okay. Orpah said, why? Because Orpah means stiff necked. Because those are the disciples that aren't going to hang out with the Lord. They're stiff necked. God don't want stiff necked children. He wants us, He came for His own. Ruth was His own. Ruth means friend and affection. She gained friendship and affection of God before she was even born, before the foundation of the world. Regardless of the struggles she's going through. So Jesus Christ says, eat my flesh, and many of them turned and went back. Does this offend you? Therefore, 65, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except that were given him of my Father. Orpah had no business going to Jerusalem. That wasn't her kingdom. It wasn't given to her of the Father. 
don't matter if she had a will. She had sure she had a desire to follow Christ. She didn't have the ability to do it because it wasn't given unto her. Where does free will apply? No such thing. You don't have a free choice unless it's unless it's put there by God. It's ludicrous. Jesus Christ, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? <laughs> Simon Peter answered on him and said, Lord, whom shall we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Isn't that what Ruth told Naomi? Back to Ruth there. 17. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried, and the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part from me and thee. Ruth knew where her allegiance stood because it was put within her. She didn't have a choice in the matter. So the one betrayed Jesus Christ with a kiss and turned and went back. Well, isn't that what the rest, the rest of the religious world is doing? Coming to Jesus Christ, professing His name, going out, spreading the gospel, paying their dues, you know, covering Christ with kisses but hating them, hating Him in their heart. That's what, the, that's what the, the, the whole gospel world is out. All these, these idiots on the radio. Every single one of them. Charles Stanley. Who's that? I was listening to that Dr. J. Vernon McGee the other night. Here's another moron for you. Yeah, Jesuit. He was talk, on there talking about, oh, uh, talking about Peter and the kingdom. I, I would be... I, I, I would... I would be ashamed to, to even sit next to Paul, you know, Paul, in the kingdom of heaven. I would be ashamed. I wouldn't even be, I wouldn't even want to stand at his feet because of, you know, because of, you know, talking about how he doesn't understand the simple fact that it wasn't Paul's works from the beginning That's right. <laughs> that got him into the place where he was. There ain't going to be greater or smaller in the kingdom of heaven. We're all going to get paid the same. Why are you getting paid the same? Because it was never your work to begin with. It was His work. So you're not going to be sitting at the feet of Peter and Paul. You're going to be sitting in a throne right there next to them in Jesus Christ. Even the, the least of us. The very least. That's why Jesus Christ says, the least of you, you exalt Him. You put Him in the high seat there. You know, He says that that many of the princes in the world, the worldly people, exercise lordship. Be not, let it be not among you, for the greatest among you will be, be your servant. That doesn't make no difference to me. There ain't no, there ain't no better or worse in the kingdom of God, because you had nothing to do with anything that was that was done by me down here. You know, it's all works mentality. They're all just deceived and being deceived. They have no idea. That, that J. Vernon McGee uh, is born from the tribe of Moab and he'll probably stay there because of how long that he's, he's been teaching and he still don't get it. Is he dead, is he dead now? Or the child of the devil? By their fruits you shall know them. I'm not judging. The Lord already judged. He wrote it down here in this book. By their fruits you shall know them. You can't preach against this word your whole life and get away with it. Sure. So, you be betrayed to Jesus Christ for the betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss. He wasn't on the radio blasting him. No, he was he was talking him up to you and you know making out like you loved him and smooching him and he just hated him in his heart. Never escaped that. So. Where do we leave off in Ruth? 
So uh, 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left off speaking unto her. Isn't that what happens when the law realizes that you're clinging to Jesus Christ? Okay, come on, let's go. Let's go to the kingdom. Let's go. Let's introduce you to your your husband. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come into Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? So all the city, what happens, the Bible says, when, when a sinner repents? When a sinner repents, what does the Bible say happens? Angels rejoice. Angels rejoice, right? In the kingdom of heaven? It's here and now. You know, the kingdom of heaven is, a, is an actual place. It's like... This is going on right here when a sinner repents. You have angels. We can't see it or hear it, but the whole angelic realm is rejoicing, praising God. You know, so that's what happened. Jerusalem, all Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Don't call me Naomi pleasant no more. Well, that's interesting. Why not? When a believer is brought into the kingdom of God, the law is, is no longer pleasant, is it? After you're brought. The whole purpose of the law is to bring you into the kingdom. Make you realize you can't do it. So after you're brought into the kingdom, when, you deal, when the law deals with you, after you're brought into the kingdom... It's a very troubling, bitter thing. Isn't it? Because you should be pretty a lot further into the kingdom and away from the law. Uh, you shouldn't be dealing with the law again, being a child of God. But isn't that what happens with all of us? You know, and it's, the law is, is God's correcting rod when you get away from Him. I mean, we're, we're some pretty staunch believers and we're you know, not like most people. We have the truth. We know the truth. When you look at what's going on in our family right now. Our whole family, everybody's dealing and, and ravaged with, with sin and, and departure from the Word of God right now. Every single one of us. <laughs> it's very bitter. Is the law pleasing to you now? Is it as exciting like when you first found God? You know, you're like, oh yeah, Lord, the law's great. You know, it's not so pleasing anymore, is it? It sucks, don't it? Your flesh is paying the price. You got uh, marital issues. You know, your kids or whatever's going on. Money issues. Why? Because the, the Lord brought the law down on you. Why? To bring you back into the uh, relationship with Him. And the law will be... Uh, uh, persist, get persistently worse and worse until you submit to Jesus Christ. You're in the kingdom now. You ain't out in this country of Moab. You're accountable. <laughs> You're not going to get away with it. That's why you know people are coming to me with my our family issues. Well, go on, let them do it. Let them do whatever they want to do. You know. They're going to do whatever they think they're going to do until the Lord twists their arm a little more. I ain't worried. I ain't worried about any of you. You're children of God. Lord, Lord will take care of it. He took care of me all right. <laughs> so I know he's, you ain't no better. You know? You ain't no better than me. Nobody's got special favor to get away from the law when it needs to be applied. That's why in Hebrews 12, we're almost done here. Paul says, Hebrews 12, 11, now, no chest chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So, those of you that are having severe issues and problems right now because of your departure from the Word, and guess what? When you're a child of God and you're uh, in the heavenly city, Mount Zion, which we are right now, the angels and Jesus Christ, two or three are gathered together, they're right here in the midst. 
we're in the kingdom of God, and you guys have the true doctrine. So if you're going to continue to deprive your soul of uh, the word of God, it's going to get worse. <laughs> it's going to get a lot worse. And uh, I feel for you, but and there's nothing I can do. I just I pray every night for it, almost every night for each and every one of you. But I don't pray that the Lord makes it easy on you. I pray for His will to be done. I don't care if He's got to kill you. Killed, took my brother, saved our family. I'll see my brother again. I'll be with him for all eternity. It sucks right now that you know we got to go these few short years, but we're going to be with Him for all eternity. You know, and if the Lord's got to use something like that to get the rest of us in shape, so be it. Yeah, it's going to be painful. Well, it's up to you on how, how, how far you're going to take this. How far are you going to meddle with uh, the Lord's correcting rod? How far are you going to let it go? That's why I get rid of that damn television. I do. I got rid. Last week, I, I was up here. I didn't have nothing to say. I didn't have nothing, no business to do with the Word of God because I was watching movies every night. You know? Saturday night, had a little too much wine, got drunk. So I, I said to the wife, I said, well, you got to get rid of these movies. You got to do what's necessary to get back into that book. Thy offendee, pluck it out. You're in the kingdom of God now. We ain't living in Moab. Lord ain't going to deal easy with you. What else is it going to take? <laughs> you think five, ten minutes of being in the Word or talking to people about the gospel when you're not living it is good enough? I don't think so. Probably three nights this week, I, I was in the book uh, with my wife for at least an hour, for four nights, at least an hour, hour and a half. I still could have done more. But now, ever since I repented, it's been a pleasure to be in that book. Pleasure. We were excited about it. We are excited. We got back our excitement about the Word again. So if you got something in your life that's hindering you, that's keeping you from coming to that book, and, and, and reserving your rightful place in the city of Zion, you get rid of it. I don't care what it is or how much it costs you. You get rid of it. It ain't cost you that much. So, Hebrews 12. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up your hands which hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight the paths of your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Lord might take one of us. You don't want that lame foot to be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Peace with all men. Peace. It ain't just appeasing the flesh to get along, to go along. You follow peace. You follow Jesus Christ. Where's it start? It starts in your house. If your house ain't right, you don't matter what you have to say to the heathen. It ain't going to make a, a damn bit of dunghill heat to the Lord. You get your house right. That's the first and foremost important thing you have in this life. It's a representation of Jesus Christ and His church. You get your house right. Get your wife in the Word. That's our obligation as men. If that ain't right, you just go out, when you go out in the world, you keep your mouth shut pertaining to the things of God. No business dealing with the kingdom, uh, meddling with the, uh, the heathen. If man know not how to take care of his own house, how shall he know how to take care of the things of God? The righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Get our house right. Don't make no never mind what you feel and what you think about the matter. The Lord will overcome it all. Every single bit of it. Puts new desires in your heart. All you got to do is repent and say, this is what I'm going to do. And do it. Get into that book.
Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Not no man shall be saved, no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Root of bitterness. Been lingering a long time, hasn't it? That root of bitterness. Preventing us from doing what the Lord would have us to do. Cut it off. Who gives a crap how we feel? Or what we think, well, that's too much for the Lord. Well, the Lord, you know, don't make no never mind, none of it. No matter what you think, the Lord will overcome it all. Get rid of that root of bitterness. Springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. You think that your issues at home are just your issues? No. It's going to defile the whole, uh, all the children of God around you. You think you can contain your sin? <laughs> the Lord, you're real to everybody. And it touches everybody too. And all of us suffer. We're all the household of God and the children of God. We have an obligation not only to ourselves but to each other. So that our walk isn't affecting our brothers. And it will. You know? And I have the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling within me ever present. So when you're walk, you know, that's why I just don't come around. So me and the Lord will dwell over here. If you're going to go live like the heathen, go ahead. You know? So many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator, profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat refused sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he saw it carefully with tears. If you're going to act like the heathen, the Lord will treat you like it. For you are not come into the mount that might be touched. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor at the blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that, that which was commanded. Can you not endure that which was commanded this morning? Well, if you can't, it's because you're a child of Esau. No way around it. If you're a child of God, you'll repent. And put yourself back in the dust. We need to do it. The law needs to be applied when you're in the kingdom of heaven. Just like Ruth. It needs to happen. Why? It's getting us ready for the marriage of Jesus Christ. You know? So, and if so much of beasts touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. This is a heavenly Zion, this kingdom of heaven, this Mount Zion we have. There ain't no beasts allowed on this mountain. None but the children of God. The Lord will kill you for your own good. You know, that you repent. He's not going to allow some beast to be running around this mountain. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto a city of the living God, a heavenly Jerusalem, and to an inherited and innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly uh, and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the sprinkling, uh, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. You can be perfect this morning. All that's required is repentance. When your little babe repents and apologizes, and I'm sorry, Daddy. He's perfect in your eyes, ain't he? Perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that speaketh on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. 
what we're preaching this morning. Jesus Christ is preaching to us all. I <laughs> do think you're, I'm getting just as much of it as you are. I made my peace a few days ago, though, earlier this week. I feel great. So, we're going to finish up here in Naomi. So that's what's going on in verse 20 in Ruth. The law said, Call me no more Naomi, but Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. The Almighty dealt very bitterly. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? That's what happens to us, huh, when we're not in good standing with the Lord. You're in the kingdom. You're afflicted. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. So she's still called the Moabitess here. You see that? She's, she's in the kingdom, but she's still referred to as a Moabitess. Why? Well, she ain't wed to Boaz yet. Boaz is, uh, what does Boaz mean? We'll get to that next week. It gets really exciting. Uh, but Boaz is uh, a picture of Jesus Christ. And the whole thing that goes on with Ruth uh, harvesting in the fields... It's going gonna, it's gonna to be awesome. So they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. In the beginning of barley harvest. Uh, which we'll get into next week. I don't want to drag it on. But do you guys see how this is all a picture of the kingdom and Jesus Christ and His church and the steps that need to be taken? <laughs> it's really pretty good. Uh, Alright, well. Come on there. God for the whole is one of the pillars in, in the temple. Yeah. Because the rest of God's people. Father, Lord, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for each other, Lord. We thank you so for holding us accountable. So much for holding us accountable, Lord, and making our lives miserable because we know that you love us and it's chastening. We thank you for it, Lord. And there's no greater joy than to know that the God of all the universe that loves us pathetically can be great you. We thank you for giving us truth, Lord. It's, it's such a blessing because it's, it's so... It's just not found today anywhere. Thank you for it. Lord, we ask that you kill our, our backsliding, our transgressions against you, and set our mind right, Father, for, so that we know what we're down here for, and we ain't down here to build up our own kingdom. Please. Uh, I really appreciate what went on between my family and the Sokol family this week uh, holding each other accountable and ask that you continue to do that, Lord. It's so needed in this church. And uh, maybe we can, uh, some other of our brothers and sisters will have a heart to come forward and ask to do the same. It helps. And uh, please continue to work here, Father. And uh, get us right. Once and for all, Lord, a long time we've been involved with this wickedness, Lord. Please be rid of it. Oh, thank you, Lord. We love you, and we ask that you help us to love you more. Jesus precious name, Amen. Amen. Cool, that's exciting. I stop it. Yeah. Will you make that make a DVD out of that one for me? Yeah.